All right, so tonight we're going to also proceed uh, with chapter nine. Uh, we're going to be talking about real estate contracts. Okay, so if you've taken either law contracts or contract forms and addendum, a lot of this material is going to sound very familiar. Okay, uh, so we're going to go ahead and knock this one out as well. So it's to distinguish among the express and implied contracts, as well as bilateral and unilateral contracts. Further, we're going to talk about executed and executory contracts, along with valid, void, voidable, and unenforceable contracts, too. So we're going to identify the requirements for a valid contract, as well as the statute of limitations for contract enforcement. We'll further explain how contracts may be discharged and remedies available to a non-defaulting party, and then further describe the differences between a promulgated and approved forms and the requirements for their particular use. We'll further discuss the provisions of the Texas Promulgated Contract, the brokers of, or a brokers avoiding the unauthorized practice of law, in the computation of time. We'll further then identify the purpose and procedures for a buyer's getting a property condition inspected. Further, we'll distinguish a list or distinguish and list the characteristics of each option contract and contract for D. So one of the key things that you need to be aware of as a real estate agent is these different forms. You will be dealing with these overall. Again, if you are a listing agent, meaning you're representing the seller, you will utilize which form, Mr. Travis? The seller, the listing agreement. That's correct. You use the listing agreement if you're representing the seller. Mr. Eugene, if you're representing the buyer, you're going to use the listing agreement too, correct? No, the buyer agency agreement. You're going to use the buyer agency agreement, okay? Now, the real estate sales contract, Mr. Keith, that's between the both real estate agents, right, Mr. Keith? Am I correct there? No. No, who are the, who's the two parties to that? The two parties for that would be the, uh, the agent no, and the broker. Oh. The buyer and the seller okay yeah, yeah got it there i got you i got you i got you you good here keith you good i probably caught you off guard you're good here so it's the it's the sales contract is only between the buyer and the seller okay um miss leela the option agreement who's that who's those two parties between um is that little... for the huh? Go for it. Go for it. Is that for the uh, the the buyer? And who else? Uh, the seller. That's right. Okay, because oftentimes Miss Leela and Mr. Keith, the options is within the sales contract. So when you when you did that one to four family we were doing in class, if you remember that last page we we're talking about that option fee, this is the option agreement. Okay. So this is that part. So basically the real estate sales contract and the option agreement is all going to be between the buyer and the seller. Okay. Uh, Mr. Garrett, what about contracts for D? Who's, who are those with, sir? Uh, like who are the parties? Yes, sir. Uh, would it be... Follow along with Miss Leela and Mr. Keith. The buyer and seller. There you go. There you go. Contracts for deed is basically contracts where you're ending up, you're making payments. Once you fully pay it off, you get the deed. Okay. So All right. Even if the okay. mortgage company had like has the deed. Mortgage would not. If there was a mortgage con, uh, mortgage company, there wouldn't be a contract for deed. Okay, okay. Makes sense? Yes, sir. Good point. Good question, by the way, actually. Thank All you. right. Let's see. Who else do I got here? 
Mr. Colton, you here tonight? Mr. Jacob, now this is going to be an easy one for Mr. Jacob. Mr. Jacob, who are the two parties to a lease? Hmm. That would be the tenant and the landlord. Got it. 100% there. Okay. That's an easy one for him. That's going to be the tenant and the landlord, not the buyer and the seller. Okay. And he used the right terminology there. Because a lot of times they'll just say, you know, buyer and the owner. It's actually tenant and landlord. He used the right terminology. Great job there. Um, let's see. Escrow agreements. Who's that with, Mr. Eugene? Escrow agreements. Uh, the, the buyer and seller. The buyer and the seller. The escrow and the option all are within the sales contract. What are they trying to do here? Travis, what are they, you, you've done the test. What's, what's the testing people trying to do? They're trying to trick you. They're trying to trick you. Let's, talk, let's have all these different terminologies and hopefully we'll get them. They like these. <laughs> That's right. So in this particular situation is they're trying to throw these at you to scare you. But in reality, most of this, majority of this is between who? Buyer and the seller. Okay. Not between brokers, not between, it's all between buyer and seller. Okay. The only time that the broker is involved is if there's listing or buyer reps. Have I at any point ever said sales agent? No, I've never said sales agent at all. At all. Why? Because in this particular situation, who is all contractual agreements with? See, they're the principal and their agent. Can you or anybody else be an agent of a principal if you're a sales agent? No. You can't. Right now, Travis, could you get a contract with Mr. Eugene to sell his house and put your name as the, the broker? No. no. So in that situation, when y'all write contracts, when my agents write contracts, who are you writing them in the name of? Of me. Of, well, yeah, technically of the, of the company, Noble's Realty Group, not myself, but of the company. Okay. So in that particular situation is you yourself can never write as a sales agent a contract or a listing agreement or buy a rent. Okay. So really the only three parties that would be involved is either going to be the majority of them, buyer and seller. And on rare occasions, the broker and either the seller or the broker and the buyer. But if you notice, it's never the broker, buyer, and seller. Okay. The only time that would occur is if it's what type of relationship? Like intermediary. Intermediary. Okay. It's the only time that would occur. So a contract, and this is the definition, is a voluntary, keyword there, voluntary agreement or promise between legally competent parties to either perform or not perform a legal act in exchange for legal consideration. Okay, so it has to be a voluntary agreement or promise. So, and this is very key that you know this. When you're taking your test, these are called elements. That's why they broke them down like this little checklist here. Every one of these have to be checked off for it to be a valid contract. If one of those are missing, do you have a valid contract? No. Okay. So all of those have to be checked for you to say that I have a valid contract. Okay. Now, like we stated before, there are two types of contracts, okay? There is express and then there is implied, right? Express basically is like this. Mr. Eugene, I would like to purchase your house for $500,000 and I would like to move in in 30 days, okay? In that situation, what have I done? Express. 
Have I created a valid real estate contract? Expressed. But I'm saying, have I created a valid real estate contract? Why are you saying no? Well, I guess so. Yeah. So you should stay with your first answer. I should say no. It's no yeah. because it's a violation of what? Statute of frauds. Remember, it has to be in writing. If I verbally say to you that I want to buy your house for five hundred thousand dollars. Okay, that's great. Yes, Mr. Eugene, it is an expressed contract because it's oral, but under Texas law, what does it say? It's got to be in writing. Okay, you got to be very careful here. No, no, no. Okay, so it has to be in writing. Okay, so expressed is that parties state their terms and show their intentions in words. So it can be either written or oral, right? However, the law also can trump this. So while, yes, Mr. Eugene, you did have an express contract, guess what I'm going to come back and say? Well, Your Honor, I just said that. I didn't put it in writing, and the law says it has to be in writing. So at that point, who wins, Stephen? Hey, I get out of it. He can't force me to buy the property because I didn't put it in writing. Okay. Now, another way that you can have a contract is through the agreements of parties that are demonstrated by their acts or conduct. This is where you run into where this where you're having this big part right here is more focused on what type of relationship. What are we talking about back here? What type of relationship? Agency relationship. Okay. Because of the fact of the matter is, the listing and the buyer agreement here, all right, this allows me to represent somebody. Do we always, Travis, in every single situation, do we always get a buyer representation? Why do you say no? Because clients do what? They what? They leave or they refuse. They simply refuse. They don't want to be locked into you. But if you start showing properties, you're doing what? that word right there implying. you're implying so if I go out and I start showing Miss Leela properties and she refused to sign a buyer rec with me and I keep showing her properties what is it eventually going to be implied I'm her agent okay so in that particular situation is my actions my conduct how I demonstrate is going to sometimes put me into a contract okay so now you need to know the differences. You have what's called bilateral, okay? And the key word right there, or the key letters of that word are the first two. And what does bi mean? Bi means what? Two. two. So in that situation, it means that there has to be two things happening. So both parties make promises. So there's two people making promises, one in exchange for another okay so most real estate contracts are what bilateral so could i have a contract say say aiden lives next door to me and every night aiden's throwing a party every night travis comes over and they're just jamming music's high as possible they're just making all this noise and i can't sleep okay can I walk over to Aiden? Can I, Mr. Eugene, can I do this? Can I go over to Aiden and say, hey, Aiden, I'll give you $1,000 if you promise never to throw another party for the remainder of your time here. Can I do that? You can do whatever you want. <laughs> can I stop you? The question comes in, can I stop you from having fun in your property? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Come back here. What's this say right here? Legally competent parties to perform or what's this word? Not perform. Not perform. So I can, Mr. Aiden, you have a right to throw parties and enjoy yourself. But I can do what? I can walk up and say, I will give you a thousand dollars if you don't ever throw any more parties here. Ever. That's well, right. But I'm saying it is an offer. Yes. And if he accepts it, he is he is voluntarily accepting uh -huh. 
to not continue to perform or to have parties. Okay. And am I giving him a legal or is it a legal act in exchange? Yes, it's a legal act. And am I giving him something of value? Yes. Yeah, giving him money. Now, if he denies it, then he denies it. But if I walk up and I say, here's you a thousand dollars, and he says, hell no, I want more, that's a what? It's a counter offer. And I say, okay, I'll give you two thousand. And he says, 5,000, we got a deal. Here's 5,000, now no more parties. Now what happens if he ends up? Throws the best party ever. 5,000. <laughs> yeah, 5,000. <000. laughs> <laughs> so if, if, I give him, if I give him $5,000, now he may go to Miss Leela's house and throw a party, okay? But he's not probably going to throw a party next door anymore. Because of why? Because I paid him to stop performing what he has a legal right to do. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So you give him this money. Yes, ma'am. And he turns around, let's just say, as they were saying, you take the money and throw a really big party. What yep. can you do if, what can you do about that? At that point, that is a breach of contract. And I can sue him, especially if he was deceptive. I can sue him for three times the amount that I was damaged. So at that point, I gave him $5,000. He throws a party that night. He was not being truthful and honest. He was being deceitful in that contractual arrangement. So I will turn around and sue him for three times actual damages and make $15,000. Oh, so that's under like the DTPA. That's correct. It's DTPA claim. Does that make sense, Ms. Lila? So if with you giving him the money, it wasn't just you handing him money. It was an actual contract. That is correct. Oh, okay. Because it is on this one, Miss Leela, it comes back here. Let me find the word again. It was an express. It was an oral contract because statute of frauds does not apply to me taking away or stopping him from performing. So there are certain things that statute of frauds apply to. That's why it also comes into these situations. Like say, Miss Leela, me and you, I say, hey, Miss Leela, let's go on a cruise. You say, okay, well, I'll end up, I'll pay for my ticket. You give me the money, okay? We're in agreement, we're in a contract, and then if we never go on that cruise, you could turn around and sue me for damages because we breached the contract. That's why a lot of times you gotta be very careful with what you say, because what you say sometimes can do what? It can put you in a contractual arrangement and in that situation can get you sued. Kind of see, and that, and Miss Leela, this actually applies a lot to counseling too. You can, when you orally agree, when a client, if I say, Miss Leela, I want to come and be counseled, I want your services, and you say, Well, my services are 250 an hour, and I say, Okay, that sounds good, schedule me for an appointment, and I don't show, there could be grounds in some situations for me breaching the contract because I agreed to perform and I did not yeah so okay. in some situations you got to be very careful but that does apply that's why one of those things why i want to take a little moment there to use that hypothetical because there are we actually have students i'll give you another one that a parent that came into town about probably now at least eight nine years ago and he ended up he told his son in front of me he said son i will allow you to end up having this house. I will buy this house and give it to you so long as you do not have or drink any alcohol and you maintain a 3.5 GPA your entire career at Texas a &E. oh. You will have, I will give you the house. You cannot drink any alcohol and you have to have a 3.5 GPA. And when you do that, I will sign over the deed to you, but you have to meet those terms. Now, coming from a college student, Mr. Aiden, mm -hmm. what would you do if your dad told you that? No alcohol, and you have to keep a 3.5, and you'll get a $300,000 house. Like he signs it over. He was going to sign it over. Oh, yes, sir. Let's go. Oh, you think that'd be easy? Uh, for the next yes. Year. No. No, it won't. Miss Leela's right. Because <laughs> let me tell you something. Wait until you end up, you find that girlfriend. 
that ends up, or that girl that wants to go out partying, and she wants you to just take one sip, just one sip. You gonna shoot them off? Oh. I'm about to get 300. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Get back good. No, uh -huh. but yes. What is what's that parent doing? What what is that parent doing, Dad? What's he what's he doing? He's, he's, he's trying to stop his son from doing what? Oh, from either drinking <laughs> and to do what? <laughs> to focus on his studies. That's right. To okay. so get in the way of having fun. That's right. Uh -huh. That's right. That's right. But again, there are people that do that. They'll actually do that to their kids. They'll tell them. They will put what they call, they'll put that carrot out there and say, if you don't do this, then here's the carrot, you get it. But you gotta get that carrot. Well, you think about it, you just got out of high school and now you're on your own free and you got all these people, guess what? They influence you, okay? So again, you gotta be very careful when you're doing this. And God forbid, Mr. Aiden, if you ran into Darren, you, you would you would be losing that house. I'm just going to tell you. So uh, I'm just going to let you know. A ain't that right, Darren? I know Darren's hearing me. I know, I know he's shaking his head right now. So <laughs> in that situation is make certain that you be careful because, again, you got to be careful of what you say. Okay? So we talked about bilateral. Now let's talk about unilateral. Unilateral, of course, is going to be a one-sided agreement. And I always tell people, you ever play Uno or you speak Spanish, what's Uno? One. One. Seven. Okay. So Uno is a one-sided agreement. So it's one party makes a promise to induce the second party to do something. So I may say, you know what? Anybody that uh, you know can find my lost dog, I'll give you 500 bucks. Do any of y'all have a duty to do that? No. no. But if you do it, what happens? You get 500 bucks. Yeah. Right? Also, an option contract. An option contract is you're giving me the right, Mr. Eugene, to do inspections, but you can't sign another contract, really. You can do a backup, but you can't sell this property to anybody else until I do inspections. So you're giving up your right to allow me to do what I need to do to decide if I want to buy this house. Okay? That's what an option contract is. But guess what? This is where they're going to trick you. Most real estate contracts are bilateral. But what then I just come over here and do? Unilateral contracts are option contracts. Mr. Gross, I'm not Richard. Yeah, Mr. Grossman and Mr. Travis and Mr. Aiden. Don't ask all of you this. Do we have separate forms for an offer, a sales contract, and an option contract? Do we have separate ones? No. What do we have? We have one contract called a what? What's it called? The one, two, four family residential resale contract. Okay. So all of it's in one. So guess what? When you take your test, you got to be what? Very careful on how the wording is said. Because otherwise, if they're talking about the real estate contract, they're talking about bilateral. But if they're talking about the option contract within the sales contract, it's what? Unilateral. Okay, got to be careful there. And isn't it the bilateral contract is what you use most of all in your life? The bilateral is what majority is, yes. Okay. Now, what about executory? Well, executory is the contract has been partially performed, right? So in this situation, how they're talking in this terms, you're actually in contract. That means all parties have done what? They've all signed. Okay. So again, you got to watch those words. Gotta watch those words because if it didn't say contract and said offer, what happens? You still could be an executory, you're just basically working back and forth in negotiations. You gotta watch your words. So, contract is partially performed. When the signed real estate contract is done, it's classified as executory. So, the minute that all parties have signed, your contract is what? Executory. 
So it means that we have to do what? After a contract is signed, Mr. Grossman, what's the first thing that the buyer's agent has to do? What do they got to schedule? Um, inspections and appraisals. Inspection and appraisal. So there are things that still need to be completed. What happens after that party has sat down and signed and money has been transferred? The contract is what? Executed. Executed, meaning it is fully what? It's done. It's done. We finished, right? We don't have any more issues. Okay. So now we're going to go back and talk about how we classify contracts. And this is what gets a lot of people. Okay. I want y'all to listen along with me. A valid contract is one that has, and I'm going to go back here, it's one that has all of these elements. So a valid contract has every single one of those, right? A void contract is missing just one of them. Just one means that it is void on its face and ain't worth nothing. Okay. So if I am 14 years old and I want to buy your car from you, Miss Linda, I have the money and I have the consideration, I have the intent, all this stuff, but I'm 14, is there a contract? Is it void? Yes. But it's also classified more towards voidable than void. Okay. And the reason why is that I'm a minor. If I'm a minor, okay, or if there's fraud that's present, then I can void that contract at any point, okay? So it may seem valid, but it may be disaffirmed. So if I was a 14-year-old and I went to buy Miss Linda's vehicle from her, and I give her cash, and we do a whole transaction, and I go and end up, I wreck it, I could come back and do what, Aiden? I could sue Miss Linda and say what? I want my she sold me a car and I'm a minor. That's right. She sold me a car, I'm a minor, and I want my money back. Give me my money. And Miss Linda, you're gonna say what? I ain't giving you no money. I'm I want my money. And the courts are gonna say what? Give the money. Give the money. Because Miss Linda, you should have known better. Not to do business with what? Minor. With a minor. Okay. So again, valid, all elements. Void, we're missing an essential element. Voidable, we're dealing with a minor or there's fraud. Okay. And here's the last one. Unenforceable. Unenforceable, Miss Linda, is in this situation. Unenforceable, I told your husband earlier that I will buy your house for $500,000, okay, and I'll pay cash. I just told him that. But here's the problem. Mr. Eugene, what's that bottom bullet say up there, sir? Or list of agreements, unenforceable. That's correct. Any oral contract, that's talking about a listing, but any oral agreement dealing with real estate, unenforceable. unenforceable. Okay. So neither party can sue to force performance. And it's valid, though, between the parties. Okay? So it's valid between the parties, but guess what? It's unenforceable. So it may have all the elements, but guess what happens? There's nothing you can do about it. It's kind of like a judgment. If I get a judgment against Aiden for $500,000 and he's broke, What's going to happen, Mr. Grossman? Am I going to get anything? No, no. Miss Linda, what do you always tell me all the time? What's it called? You can't get blood out of a turnip. Same thing. So in that situation, you got to be careful. Now, the elements of a valid contract, as we talked earlier, they put them back up here for you. Number one, it has to be legally competent parties. So the only people that can be incompetent are minors, right? Who else could be incompetent? <coughs> elderly. elderly people mentally disabled. and the mentally disabled. Anyone that is classified by a court order can be incompetent. Okay. 
Okay. So you have to be very careful. The offer and acceptance. Okay. There has to be an offer and an acceptance. Okay. Consideration. There has to be something of worth value. Now the question they're going to hit you on the exam is that it always has to be what? It always has to be what? Talking to me. No, I'm asking everybody. Oh, in consideration. No, no. Does it always have to be money? No, no. No, no what's it have to be? Whatever you find valuable. That's the word I was looking for. Anything that has value. So, Mr. Stahl, got a question for you, sir. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm going to ask you this one question. Are you, do you like cars? Yeah. Okay. So an old 1960s Ford Mustang, would that be of interest to you? Yeah, did you like it? Okay, so that has value to you, right? Okay, Miss Linda, a 1960s Ford Mustang, you have any interest in that? Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> you don't want it, I'll take it. <laughs> See, here's the difference here, okay? In that particular situation, what happens? We're already seeing that to one person, it's a big thing. It's worth something. But to somebody else, what is it? I'll put another one. You like watching TV, Aiden? Or playing video games? Ah, there's one thing right there. That's good. Not really. Travis? Yeah. Devin? Yeah. Okay, so we have two yeses and a no. Miss Linda, how about TV to you? You can go out the door to my car. See a problem here? So if I was to go over, if I go over, and same thing with Mr. Eugene. You like TV? Oh, I like TV. Yeah. He loves TV. Uh-huh. I mean, I don't uh -huh. spend my time with my wife. Uh-huh. Chelsea, <laughs> <laughs> she knows to the car file in here. So in that situation that you're seeing here, consideration value depends. Okay. So if I tell you, hey, Aiden, I'll give you my 50-inch screen TV uh, instead of cash for the option, okay? Aiden may be like, I want that. That ain't worth nothing to me, okay? So in that situation, is consideration does not always mean to be money. Something of value that the person may like, okay? <clears throat> legal purpose. There has to be a legal purpose. It cannot be illegal. Stephen can't tell you, Travis, hey, I'll buy your land because I want to grow some weed on it. It's got good soil. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put some weed on it. Okay, can't do that. Not legal purpose. We're not in Colorado. Okay. In a right, it also has to be. Guess what, Mr. Eugene? In writing and signed. Okay. So real estate sales contracts and leases for more than a year have to be in writing and signed. And look at this last one here. What did we just talk about? Just just a little bit ago. Legal description. You gotta have a legal description within the contract. Okay. For a legal competent party, the individual must be 18. They can be married or minority status can be removed by the court. Okay. They also must be free from any mental handicap. If they're adjudicated incompetent, it is a void contract. If they have not been adjudicated, but there's history of it, it's a voidable contract. Okay. Well, by the way, I, I want to tell those of you that are listening at this, maybe at another time, students that end up in some situations, they go over there and they want to have the, uh, the pet, basically the, um, Service animal. Thank you, sir. They want to have the service animal. While it may be nice to get to carry your dog or your pet around with you, okay, understand in some situations a court or a person could argue what? That you're not, you've not been adjudicated incompetent, but what could they possibly try to argue? That there that you've not been, however, you do have a mental handicap. Thus you are potentially not competent for a contract. So you got to be very careful with that, okay? 
your offer and acceptance. All terms must be agreed upon. A contract is not agreed upon if there's still discussion. I have people that try this all the time with my agents, all the time. Okay, they'll go over and they'll be like, okay, you know, Aiden, yeah, I know your sign, your clients have signed and mine signed, but we still want to change that one thing, but we're still under contract. No, you're not. No, you're not. If you are still negotiating terms. And that contract, yes, it's been signed, but you're still negotiating. You are not in a contract because you are still negotiating. Okay. So all agree, our terms must be agreed upon. And you can't, as a real estate agent, you cannot let people push you around. Guys and gals, I'm going to tell you this. In this industry, especially if you're young, these older experienced agents are going to eat you alive. They are. They are very savage. Okay. We had an agent, one of my older agents today, told a couple of us, basically said this. You don't have to apologize for anything. You work for your client. You stand your ground. Don't you let them dictate you for their failure. You stand your ground. Mr. Grossman did a great job today. He stood his ground. He dealt with what he had to, he stood his ground. But you cannot let these agents push you around. They will, I promise you. And a lot of times, and Miss Lila probably knows what I'm saying too, they will a lot of times in some of these situations, they'll test you. They will test to see how far they can push you. You gotta put your foot down firm. You're not representing yourself. Who are you representing? Your clients. And you also in the same situation, not only do you have to deal with your client, but you also have to deal with many other third parties. Am I correct? Okay. You're dealing with a lot of people. You got to establish from the beginning, you don't play around. And sometimes that means you have to be very assertive on the phone. Yeah. Makes Even sense. then sometimes they won't give you what you want. That's right. But you know what? If you show them that you're not going to buck it or budge, you're not going to move, they have to figure something out. One of you have to. And if you're not moving, it's going to be them. You see. And especially if you're on the right side of the situation. If you know you've done your job, don't you let them backtracking you and get you to say something. You stand your ground. Okay? And that's hard, especially for younger people. Because I want to tell you something. Those of you that are older, you understand sometimes where, especially if you're a mama or you've been a mama, oh, you know sometimes you got to stand, stand your ground. If you've been a father, you're going to stand your ground. Okay? So in that situation, you have to make certain that you stand your ground when these people try to push you around. Okay? So again, it cannot involve misrepresentation, fraud undue influence or duress. If it's present at all, any of those are present, what is it? It's voidable. Okay. Now consideration is that which is given in exchange for something of another, like we've already talked about. A promise in exchange for a promise can also be consideration. It must be good and valuable, that's the key words, between the parties. Now here's one that I'm going to I'm going to state before I proceed. Can love and affection be consideration aid? Yes. Why? Because if <clears throat> both parties deem it good and valuable. Then so you're telling me Mr. Eugene could sell to Miss Linda something and never change money whatsoever. Correct. Absolutely. Is that true, Miss Linda? Mr. Eugene, can you do that? Why? Because of what? There's love and affection. You care about that person, so you end up, you give to that person. Could you imagine if Travis, every time you and Elizabeth wanted to, to exchange or, or transfer money, you had to do a full-blown contract? Could y'all imagine that? Miss Linda, every contract, that, every time you wanted to give your husband something, you had to write out a full-blown contract and y'all both have to sign it. 
That'd be a mess, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. So again, that situation is good and valuable is determined by who? The parties. The parties. Okay. Usually a buyer promises money in exchange, of course, for a seller's promising of a deed. Okay. And again, you have to have legal purpose. We also talked about it must be in writing and signed. And that comes down to the statute of frauds. Okay, so to prevent fraudulent proof of fictitious oral contracts, because it's easy to deal with he said, she said. Right, Miss Linda? Yeah. Miss Linda, Travis told me that he was selling me his $500,000 house for $1. Travis is like, who the heck are you? You remember me, Travis. We sat at the bar the other day and you said you're gonna give me a give me your house for one dollar. Yeah, see, what are you talking about? I wasn't there. No, he was. Aiden, Aiden, you saw it, right, Aiden? And then him. all I did was I was fight you. And then all I did. <laughs> I don't remember that. We're all delirious. So in that situation, what happens? You end up, you turn into this particular situation that it can become a mess very quickly. Okay, So it prevents fraudulent proof of fictitious real estate. Because what could I have really done? I could have had a whole conspiracy. All right, Aiden, I'm going to give you $1,000 just to tell Miss Linda that Travis said this. And hey, Stephen, here's you $1,000, and you're also going to say that, that Travis said that, okay? Now, we're going to go over to Miss Linda. We're going to sue Travis to get his house. Well, what happened here? I just ended up, I got three people against Travis, and I didn't even talk to Travis. He don't even know who the heck I am. And here I am trying to take his stuff. And if Miss Linda, if three people come to you and tell you that, hey, Travis said this, what are you going to assume? take those three words. You're going to take those three people? Well, no, I, you. Thank you. I was delirious. What can I say? <laughs> so in that situation, it's got to be in writing. It cannot be oral. Okay. Again, it needs signature of all parties that's going to be involved in it. And both spouses, if the homestead or community property. In Texas, you normally have to, if the property is held by a husband or a wife, most of the time, you have to have both spouses present to sign off. Okay? Not all the time, but most of the time. Can I ask a question on that? Yes, ma'am. What if, is it both spouses, if homestead? So more likely what I'm thinking in my mind is the homestead, the title is in both of their names. What happens if one of them deceased? Do you have to get that title change where that other spouse's name is off of there where it will reflect that it's just the wife or the husband alive? Say that one more time. In other words, if there was a homestead, husband and wife, yes. okay, both names are on the title. Yes. God forbid one of them passes away. Yes. Do you have to go ahead and have that uh, the title changed over reflecting that the other spouse is dead and it's only that one spouse living or how does so you would have to do a probate in that situation and the probate would then amend any of that paperwork okay. if there's a death because strange things come across this i was just wondering yes there's a lot of different things that can occur and there's been times where i've been in a transaction and one of the parties died oh that's lovely and through that before been through one where I was sitting, supposed to close, and the party that was supposed to sign died the night before closing. And guess what? What did we talk about earlier? If a party dies, what happens, Stephen? That contract does what? Void. Void. It's done. So at that point, you're kind of out of luck. And there's no other party to do the contract with it. That's right. Okay. Thankfully, the estate still allowed us to proceed, but it delayed every day. Okay? Because you got to go through probate and all of this, and so it just makes a huge mess. I was just curious about that. Yes, we will eventually get that one day again. It always happens. There's always something crazy that happens. The more time people are involved, what happens? The more people are involved, the more crazier things happen. Okay? We got enough craziness right now. We may need to just keep Lila on staff, and so she can, just, she can counsel 24-7. That's what we might need to do. 
<laughs> She'd be down for that. So in that situation, you've got to make certain by all means that you're prepared for anything. Okay. Um, if the sellers are co-owners, then guess what? Each person must sign. Anybody that has ownership has to sign. If uh, the agent may sign with power of attorney. However, you need to, number one, talk to your broker and ask your broker, do they even allow this? Okay, because the fact of the matter is, is that that liability with a real estate agent signing on behalf of their client is super high. Okay, and a lot of times the insurance companies will not allow it. The broker, I know mine personally, will not allow my agents nor myself to sign on behalf of the client. Okay, and if I do, I'm taking 100% liability on myself. Okay, so you do not ever want to do that but it is allowed, okay? Now, another thing on here is what we call the UETA. Now, those of you that do not like computers, you probably hate this act, okay? Those of you that love computers, you are so thankful for this act, okay? The UETA allows and it permits electronic records and electronic signatures, meaning there is no longer do I have to go chase down my clients to get them to sign okay no longer do i have to chase them down and get them to sign i can send them an email they can click on it and it comes back to me and i can forward it i don't have to physically have a signature okay so even if a law requires an original on paper in writing signed witness or acknowledged guess what it still allows me to permit for electronic signature but the key here is only if the parties agree. Both parties have to agree. Now, a county court may receive electronic records and may record electronically. A lot of courthouses, judges are now allowing for you to actually file stuff electronically. You don't have to physically go in and file anymore, which was, I used to be a runner for a law firm, and I wish that was happening back in my day because I used to have to run to the courthouse at least 10 times a day to go file something, okay? Not fun. I remember like last last year when I got on a uh, speeding ticket, I did everything online. Yep. Like I, instead of having to go in and sit down and have them like talk about everything, you have to take this and do this or whatever, I just called them yep. and when I was done, instead of sending in, going in with like my expensive driving form and all that stuff, I just emailed it and that was it. And they just were like, cool, you're good. Yep. That's basically it. And it allows a lot of things in a lot of courts, especially in Houston, Austin, Dallas, all the bigger cities. That's what they're doing. There's so many people, they have to be more efficient. So it's a positive. And sometimes people, we travel a lot more. So you get a speeding ticket in Dallas while you're coming back home to Houston or College Station. You don't want to have to drive back up to Dallas to redo it. Okay, you got to end up, you can do it virtually. Uh, again, if a non-original paper document, which is faxed, emailed, or copy, is presented for recording, it has to attain or contain or be attached to an, as an exhibit to a document that contains the original signatures and it's acknowledged or sworn before a notary. So if I'm sending an email and I want it to go into public record, I have to have a notary put an acknowledgement stating that this is a true document, okay? Now, of course, the next one was legal description. It must be in real estate sales contracts. The property must be identifiable with reasonable certainty. And the street address is not sufficient legal address. Okay, it's, it's included in contracts as reference only. Okay, but ultimately it's the legal description has to be provided. Now in regards to contracts performance, okay, we have to have a reasonable time uh, and it has to end up, it doesn't have to be specific, but we have to have a reasonable time frame. Okay. Now time is of the essence. If you see that in a contract, it's within the time limit that's specified. Okay. And again, that's oftentimes in the uh, termination option. Now the four corners doctrine, this is very key, is the intent of the parties 
of the four corners of the documents. So guess what that means? They only are going to look at the paper. If you're going to orally try to submit something, guess what they're going to say? It's not on this paper. We're not going to allow it. And that goes into the parole evidence rule, where it says it prohibits the use of extrinsic evidence that contradicts the contract. So whatever the contract says, that's the contract. Okay. Now, an assignment is the substitution of the parties, and it transfers the rights and or duties. The original obligor remains secondary or secondarily liable unless released. So in this particular situation is I may assign, for example, my interest in a contract to you, Aiden, but I may still be liable if you don't let, uh, fulfill your performance. Okay. Now, it may not be assigned if personal quality or the unique ability of a party is required, such as a listing contract. I cannot assign a contract out that I have to list. If I tell a seller that I'm going to list the property, I cannot then subsequently send it over to Aiden when they hired me. Does that make sense? Yeah, you got to be careful with that. An ovation is where we have what's called the substitution of contracts. It's the intent to discharge an owed obligation. And it must be supported by consideration and include essential elements of a contract. Basically, novation means we've discharged ourselves. We're no longer liable for it. To discharge a contract, number one, complete performance is our very first one. We can discharge by fulfilling our duties. So we feel all of the terms, carried them out, we've done our job. Another one is breach. A breach of contract is where one party defaults. Now you can sue for specific performance and or seek other relief, such as arbitration, mediation, injunction, or sue for compensatory damages, okay? Or you can terminate the contract, get the earnest money as liquidated damages, and by doing this, it releases both parties, but guess what? There's no other remedy that can be solved, okay? Now, there, of course, is partial performance that can occur, there can be substantial performance, sometimes even impossibility of performance. If I'm trying to purchase Aiden's house and all of a sudden a sinkhole co happens and eats up his house, can I buy your house anymore, Aiden? No. No, it's not impossible. Not going to be able to buy that house. Probably don't want it either. Okay? So in that situation, there can be impossibility. Sometimes me and Aiden, we may just say, you know what? Screw it. We're out of this and walk away. There's also the operation of law through voiding by a minor, like we've talked about, or if there's an expiration of the statute of limitations, okay? Now, what exactly is the statute of limitations? Well, it's a specific time limit during which parties may sue to enforce their rights. And in most contracts, it's four years. So you have four years from the date of the breach to bring a lawsuit, okay? And that's if you want specific performance to happen. You want them to still sell you the house. Under a DTPA violation, it's two years from the date the buyer discovered or could reasonably have discovered the deceptive act. So if you see your DTPA timeline, timeline is shrunk by half. Now, the promulgated forms, the sales contracts are going to be, like we said earlier, they are promulgated by who? What, by what committee? Nope. They're promulgated by TREP, but I'm sorry, they're promulgated by TREP, but who creates them? The Broker Lawyer Committee. Okay, you're right, Ms. Linda, they are promulgated by TREP, but the Broker Lawyer Committee drafts them. That's what I was trying to get to. Okay. Now, they may fill in forms and add factual statements or business details. You as an agent 
and I, as a broker, can fill in forms and put in business details and factual statements. We may strike out only at the principal's direction. However, you better better make certain your broker allows that. I don't allow. It. Some brokers might, but I personally do not like you messing with something that's wrote by attorneys and then reviewed by Trey. Okay, too much of a liability and risk there. If they want something striked out, I advise them to go see counsel. Let counsel then do that. Okay, not me. I may, or you also may not add to a promulgated form details for which there's another promulgated form. So if there's an addendum, can I just type whatever I want in there, Ms. Linda? No, what am I going to do? I check the box and do what? Add it to my contract. Okay. It protects from practicing law without a license if you use it correctly. Okay. And you must use unless there are these four exceptions. Okay. So if the license holder is functioning solely as a principal, then you don't end up, you don't have to worry about anything. You're representing yourself. You don't have to use that form. If you're representing an agency of the United States government, then you have to use their form. Okay. If the contract has been prepared by the property owner or an attorney and they require it for that property, I got to use it. If there is no standard contract or form that's been promulgated, then I must use Trek's approved form or use a contract that's drawn up by an attorney. Did I ever say up here that a broker or real estate agent can draft any forms? No, you should never draft forms, okay? Now, when dealing with offer and acceptance, the goal is to achieve mutual assent, meaning that both parties are in agreement. Again, all offers must be presented unless the seller has instructed the broker not to bring offers below a certain price, or the seller has a binding contract on the property and has instructed the broker in writing not to bring offers. If you're going to be told not to bring offers, it needs to be number one, told to your broker or your office manager or your team lead or whoever, and they will tell you how they want you to deal with that. Don't ever just assume, make certain that your broker or team lead or office manager knows about it, okay? Again, contracts are to be, what's that word? Promptly, Promptly present it to the seller. So Miss Linda, help me here. So Miss Leela, I'm selling Miss Leela's house and I've gotten 10 offers today, but I'm going out of town for the weekend. So I'll give it to her on Monday. That's promptly, right? No. Why is that not promptly? I'll be back Monday and tomorrow's Friday. So Miss Leela won't mind if I don't give it to her for four days. No, communication is the key. But what's that say up there? Promptly. Promptly. Mm -hmm. So promptly means when? The time that you receive the information. Well, in this day, in this day and age, as quickly as possible. Yes. If you're driving, should Travis, if he's driving and he got an offer on a contract, should he be texting and driving, Miss Linda? No, when you get to your safe spot. When he gets to a place where he can safely yeah. respond. Or okay. 10 p.m. Yeah, if it's at 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock, yes, you can wait till the next morning. Okay. That doesn't mean, like you said, Travis, it doesn't mean instantaneous. That's not the word. Also, can't you, for example, I'm selling Eugene's house. Aiden sends me an offer. Yep. But I know Linda's sending me one in three hours. Can't I wait for hers to come in? If it comes in at a certain point at the time and then send them both over? On the test, no. Okay. But in real life, how practice? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense? On the test, no. Okay. The test says it's got to be as soon as oh. possible. But in real life, what do most agents do? I feel like as long as it's, no. open, like it's, it's three hours. I feel like that's still wrong. It's like still, it's, yeah. It's not like I'm waiting three days to hear from right. somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's another thing. Is as long as it's within that same day, to me personally, that's classified as prompt. As long as it's within yeah. the same day. Now, let me rephrase myself. 
within business hours. Because some people will say, well, I sent it at 11.59 p.m. And I got it at, you know, midnight. <laughs> so that doesn't count, okay? It needs to be as prompt as possible. That's the key word, okay? Now, multiple offers may be presented together. That comes back to yours, Travis, which you were asking. So each potential buyer's agent must be notified, though, did you see this? Each potential buyer's agent must be notified of the multiple offers, okay? And the terms and conditions of other offers must be confidential. So if Aiden, you've got five offers coming in, and Stephen calls you and says, well, what's your, what's your offers? What, what are the, the terms of them? You have to say, I'm sorry, I cannot disclose that to you. Okay, so you have to say, I cannot disclose that to you. It's confidential. Okay, that's very key. Now, here's the key point. And this is where a lot of people get confused. Okay, and I'm going to just tell you this because I've dealt with this many times. The counter offer voids. You see that? Not voidable, not unimportant. It voids the original contract. Period. Void. So if I go over and I get a contract, Miss Linda, from you to buy Stefan's house. So I get a contract from you, you're buying Stefan's house. And Stefan calls to me and says, well, do you think that Linda would take, you know, 5000 more or pay 5000 more to buy my house? And I say, well, let me just call Linda and ask her. Hey, Linda, um, you know, I talked to my client. And he's just curious. Would you possibly be interested in offering 5000 more? And she says, no, what we sent is what we got. What have I just done? I voided the contract because what did I just do? I countered it. Even if I make it a simple question, that question could be classified as a counteroffer and it voids their offer. And I've had that happen before. Client, I told a client, no, I can't talk to them about that because if I do, I could possibly be countering, which could void it. Well, just ask them. Well, I'm just letting you know if I do it, they may rescind. Well, just, just ask them. They won't do that. I'm just letting you know. No, no, just do it. I call them. Hey, Miss Linda, would you uh, would y'all pay five thousand dollars more? Screw off, Justin. We ain't even. We're taking our stuff back. Bye. Click. Oops. Then I gotta go over here to Stefan. Uh, Stefan, you know about Miss Linda? Yeah. Uh, she just rescinded everything. Then your client does what? Well, what did you do? You did something. You, 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 you. When in reality, who was it? Them. Them. Okay. So in that situation, okay, you got to end up, you got to deal with it. But if there are going to be any counters, the changes have to be initialed by all parties. If they do, if Ms. Linda says, yeah, I'll do that, then they need to be marked out through the contract and all parties need to initial. Now, offers and counter offers may, of course, be withdrawn any time before acceptance. So I can send a contract out and then say, hey, I rescind that. But I have to do it before what? Before it's accepted. That can get really confusing. It can get very confusing. If an offer is not accepted until the person making the offer has been notified. So again, Mr. Eugene, if I send you a contract on your house for $500,000 in writing, and you sign it and you put it on your table there, are we under contract? Nope. Why not? Hey, we got it yet. I still have it sitting here. You still have it sitting there. How do I know you've accepted it? I don't. Yeah. So I. And so really, when the offer is accepted, it's not when the last party signs. It's when I've been notified. It's when that party has been notified. And notification, here's the good thing, may be orally. So Mr. Eugene could call me and say, what? I accept your offer. I'll be sending over the paperwork. We're in a contract. Okay. Now, notification of acceptance must be delivered to the agent or to the buyer in a sub-agency transaction. If there is a buyer's agent in a buyer agency transaction or the selling agent. Okay, so that means, let me ask you this, I'm going to trick you on this test too. 
Aiden is representing Miss Linda. Okay, so you're you are representing Miss Linda as a buyer's agent. You put a contract, you give it to me. I get the contract, I give it to Stefan. Stefan agrees to it, signs off on it. I go over and I call you and I say, Hey, Aiden, um, my client accepts your client's offer. Okay. But Miss Linda sent you an email 10 minutes after you sent me the contract saying she withdrew her offer. What happened? This is very key here. So all agents, Stefan and Travis, you'll need to listen to this. You sent me an offer. I have given it to Stefan. Stefan has signed. I have called you and said, Stefan has signed. I will be getting it to you here shortly. You open your email looking for that offer from me and you see an email from 10 minutes after you sent it to me for Miss Linda withdrawing her offer. What happens? I think it'd be withdrawn. No. It is not withdrawn because here's the thing. We never been notified. And so whose fault does it come back on? You. Because you failed to do what? To be watching your email. So this is very key. This is what I tell people all the time is when you talk to your clients and you are sending out a contract, okay, especially as a buyer or a seller's agent, you need to make certain that you make it clear to them that once this is sent, it's pretty much done. Or if they're thinking or hesitating about that, you know, they need to call you or text you. Reason being is, if you're like me, I don't get to check my emails every five minutes, okay? I don't sit down and check them. I don't sometimes even have my text messages or my calls because I'm in stuff, okay? But when I send a contract, I make it clear that if you want to bag out, you better call my office or call something, and why am I doing that? Because you need to know right away that that contract needs to be voided. Do you see what I'm saying? So in that particular situation, it's very key that you watch out from these situations because sometimes you can get your client locked into a contract and you're screwed. Okay. The effective date. It's going to be the date of the final initialing and signing by all parties. It is the date on which the acceptance was communicated and it is the last party. You are here last party to initial and sign fills in the dates. It is not always going to be the selling agent. It can sometimes be the buyer's agent, okay? Because the selling agent may make counters. And if they make counters, then the buyer's agent would be, okay? Now, how do we terminate offers? This is talking about offers, not uh, count our contracts. Well, expiration of a reasonable time. I know there are plenty of real estate agents out in this field that they'll send out offers all over the place. They'll put, give one to you, and one to you, and one to you, and one to you, and everybody else out here. Okay? They'll just, it's, it's just free food, right? Free candy. Here you go. All right? But the problem with that, when you end up sending out multiple offers, what do you, what do you put yourself into? What if they all accept them? Now you guess what? You got 15 offers out and they all got accepted. You're pretty much screwed. Okay. But if I send out 15 offers and I never hear back from Stefan, well, it's going to expire within a reasonable time. Okay. If it's revoked prior to acceptance, we just talked about that. If it's revoked prior to acceptance, it's terminated. If it is rejected, simple, just straight out, I reject. If they counter, if there is a death of the offeror or offeree prior to acceptance, if there is insanity prior to acceptance, if that person falls bankruptcy, or if there's a change in the law, okay? 
Now there are, of course, sales contract issues. There can be liquidated damages. Okay, so if there's issues, there could be liquidated damages. There are certain options, contingencies, as well as addenda, disclosures in regards to equitable title, destruction of the premises, earnest money deposits, as well as computation of time are all key issues that can affect the contract. A real estate agent may not receive a fee for referring a buyer or a seller to a home warranty. You cannot go out and say, hey, Travis, you own a home warranty. Give me a fee and I'll refer all my people to you. Can't do that. It's against the law. An agent also may not discourage a principal to a real estate transaction from employing a lawyer. It's not a wise idea to end up in a situation recommending they not hire an attorney. There are plenty of them that will try to do that. Okay. <clears throat> When it appears that there are unusual matters that are involved in a transaction, a license holder must advise each party to consult an attorney. Okay, If there are things that are going on that's not right, we need to advise our clients to consult an attorney. A lot of times real estate agents will try to resolve it themselves. No, bring in an attorney. Okay. A license holder may not employ or pay for the services of a lawyer to represent the principal. You cannot go and pay for the attorney in that situation. And the reason being is sometimes people will do that, hoping that that attorney won't sue them. Okay, you can't do that. Trick licensed home inspectors. Okay, on the property condition, there, there are licensed home inspectors. They will provide a standard report form, and it notes the deficiencies in systems and their components. It is a condition that, in the inspector's reasonable opinion, adversely and materially affects the performance of a system or component or constitutes a hazard to life, limb, or property. Okay. The home inspector gives us an understanding of what the property is in its present condition. It's not talking future. It's not talking past. It's talking in its present condition. The report must be issued within three days and prior to the termination option time frame. You always want to have all of that before your option is basically going to end. Again, you also can have other licensed contractors also come out and look at a property. The buyer does have the option if deficiencies are reported to number one, terminate under the termination option, obtain further evaluations, request the seller to take or to make all or some repairs at the seller's expense, make the repairs himself or herself, or live with the reported deficiencies. Again, you can also have residential service contracts, which is a home warranty, to help mitigate some of these situations. Again, what if there is a dispute within the contract? Well, in the contract itself, it states that the parties can go to alternative dispute resolution, which is mediation, okay? And the key about mediation is mediation helps you Get the parties to the table to try to remedy the issue before they actually go to court. Okay. Now I can tell you, out of all the ones I've ever dealt with, 99% of the time, we don't ever go to mediation. It goes straight to litigation. Okay. Uh, just because one of the parties does not want to sit down and talk to the other. They just don't want to see each other. So they will go and hire an attorney to fight it out. Okay. Also, construction of new homes or remodeling. It does have the Residential Construction Liability Act. Uh, this is where builders and remodelers may repair poor construction before litigation. That's an option. Contractors may inspect the property. Uh, within 45 days of notice, the builder may offer money, repair, or cure the matter. And if the homeowner unreasonably rejects the offer, 
then the jam damages are going to be limited. Sometimes you'll actually have that. The builder will go in, they'll build a house, and the homeowner is expecting a brand new house. Tear this one down and put a new one up. It doesn't work like that. Okay. It ends up in the situation the homeowner, if they are going to be unreasonable in their request, their damages are going to be limited. Okay. In an options agreement, again, this is the right to purchase by a specified date under the set terms and conditions. The option E must pay money for the option right. The option money will be forfeited if the purchase is not completed. Okay. And the owner must sell if the option, option E chooses to buy, and that creates a unilateral contract. Now, the termination option in a TREC sales contract states that a buyer may create an option contract. There is unrestricted right to terminate within that stated period of time, and the buyer has to pay an option fee. It may be credited to purchase, and it's non-refundable if the contract is terminated. The client decides after they do inspections, this ain't for me, I'm out of here. They lose their earnest money or their option money, not their earnest money. So they lose their option money, but they do get their earnest money back. In an option further, in a contract for deed, this is an installment contract. It is governed by the Texas Property Code subchapter D and it's highly technical procedures and disclosures. The buyer will get possession and title transfers once the conditions have been met. The equitable title will be prior to the actual title and the purchaser may elect to convert into recorded title if they wish. There, however, is no TREC form for contract for deeds. So that means what, Mr. Eugene? If there's no TREC form for contract for deeds, it means what? No contract. Huh? No contract. Nope. It means do you do you draft it? Nope. Do I draft it? Nope. Who drafts it? A lawyer. An attorney should be the one that drafts the form. If there is never a TREC form, you hire an attorney. Now, what happens, Mr. Eugene, if Aiden wants to do a contract for deed and he pulls out a napkin and he writes something down and says, this is what I want to use? You have to use it because Aiden stated it. Now, does that mean Miss Linda has to agree to that form? No, Miss Linda can do what? Nope, I ain't using that. Okay, you probably should. Okay, you never know. But there are people that do write deals on napkins. Okay. So a contract for deed is the seller's concerns is that the purchaser leasing to another party. Sometimes they may lease it out or they may damage the property. Okay. In the buyer's concern, the seller may, uh, seller may not make payments on a prior loan. Okay. There may be a death of the seller, which may leave them in limbo. And there could also be a judgment lien against the seller, which could force the seller of the house. And they're pretty much screwed. Okay. All right, Mr. Grossman, is that the last one, sir? All right. So in that particular situation, that covers chapter nine. So y'all, we did a great job. We knocked out a lot tonight. So go ahead, Mr. Grossman, and stop this recording for me.